think we can start this uh, this session, this program, or that would be a, a couple of days speaking about the novel topics in multiple myeloma. And I will be sharing this session with Marie B. So today we will have uh, like a, some talks about the biology, the disease evaluation, and the prognosis in multiple myeloma with some of the top speakers in uh, well, internationally renowned about well, the different well, these are different topics, the biology of the precursor states, the immune system, genetics, MRD evaluation, novel proteomics, and crystal stratification. And at the end, we will have a keynote lecture. We can say how to achieve the cure in myeloma. And tomorrow, we will speak more about uh, novel drugs and novel uh, targets and in the pathogenesis of multiple myeloma. So I think uh, we can start. Well, first of all, we will have uh, Irene Gabriel speaking about the biology of, of precursor states. Is a well-renowned speaker about that, and well, we will, you will be the first to, to start this this program, uh, Irene. So thank you very much all for for joining us, and as you can see, we learn as uh, in a Zoom as in a family, everybody. But so it's thank you very much. All right. Well, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. That um, so I'll take you through some of the work we do in the lab and how we translate it to the clinic, uh, and look forward to working with many of you, especially Marie V and others. Um, and I think it starts with the question of why uh, why do we wait for people to present with symptoms? In fact, if you think about every patient we see today with multiple myeloma, it's because they had anemia or bone pain or fractures or kidney problems they go and see their primary care doctor, and then finally they come and see us, which means that you're waiting for symptoms to happen, and then you see the patients, which is very reactive. And you can think about that for all cancers. Can we change the way we think of it, and can we detect them early before patients have symptoms so that we're proactive about it? And then by doing that, we treat them early and potentially can change their survival. Now, we're lucky enough in MGUS and smoldering myeloma that actually we can diagnose patients at the asymptomatic stage. And although we're not screening yet for patients with MGUS, although I hope we do in the near future, we diagnose many of those patients when they see their primary care doctor. And for some reason or another, they're incidentally found to have a monoclonal protein, but they still do not meet the criteria of myeloma. And truly, the question is, can you detect early? We know that cancer screening saves lives. And as you can see here, for example, mammography or colonoscopy can make a huge difference in early detection and early interception. Yet a simple blood test for a serum protein electrophoresis is much easier to do than doing a mammography or colonoscopy. And even when di we diagnose patients with early monoclonal proteins, MGUS or smoldering myeloma, the standard of care is still telling them watch and wait, or as our patients say, watch and worry until they have end organ damage, until they have CRAB criteria. Yet, if you think about it, usually you don't tell anyone with metastatic cancer, wait until you have all of the metastases and then I treat you. You try to treat them in stage one, stage two, because that's the curative intent. So the question is, we have amazing drugs already. Can we potentially take them earlier to treat a stage one or a stage two myeloma, which is not you know, the typical staging of end organ damage, and see if we can indeed have a curative intent in those patients. So to do that, we divided really our work uh, here into three different uh, pillars, early screening, risk stratification, because not every patient with MGUS or smoldering myeloma will develop myeloma. Uh, so you do want to make sure that you don't over-treat or under-treat patients, and truly changing the way we think of early interception, because it, what an opportunity for us to think of redesigning everything we've learned about in the last 15 years of myeloma and not repeating the same mistakes again, although many of them were not mistakes, they were amazing um, studies that were successful. Uh, and for that, we had to start from creating cohorts because we did not have a centralized cohort for MGUS and smoldering myeloma. So we started with a cohort called PCROWD or precursor crowdsourcing. And indeed, this is direct to patient access where we tell patients wherever they are in the nationwide, in the US and now international, to give us samples if they are diagnosed with MGUS and smoldering myeloma. And we serially annotate their clinical data. So we have now over the last six, seven years, 3,000 patients where we follow them routinely for blood and bone marrow biopsies. And then the PROMISE study was started 
four years ago to ask the question, can we screen for the first time, but not as in the ISTOP study, the whole nation, which is impressive. We said that in the US, we're gonna screen only people who are at risk, meaning either African-American or people of African descent or people who have a first degree family member with blood cancer. And the hope is to screen 30,000 individuals or to reach a positive number of 3,000 cases, whichever comes first. And we may actually reach the 3,000 earlier because as you will see, our prevalence rate is much higher than we expected. And then many other cohorts, the international cohort of Pangea, which helps us understand the dynamic progression of MGAS. And of course, we're lucky here that Mass General Brigham has 40,000 serial samples collected from people who see us in all of the New England area. So with that, our first cohort that we screened uh, to look for the prevalence of monoclonal protein in a high risk population, not in a general population, uh, and this was published just uh, uh, last year or this year, actually early this year, we screened the first 7,622, we're now up to 12,000 patients. Most of those patients were between the Mass General Brigham and the Promise, but they were only the people at risk, meaning African Americans. And as you can see here, this is the largest number of African Americans screened to date, 2,439, and then people with a first degree family member. And again, because we're enlarging and enriching for family members, we're starting to ask many questions of germline sequencing in high risk individuals. Now you can see here that the prevalence was done by mass spectrometry, by binding site, uh, and then we also confirmed it by serum protein electrophoresis, as well as by mass spectrometry by Mayo Clinic. Now we can detect with, by the mass spectrometry monoclonal proteins at a much lower level compared to the serum protein electrophoresis and immunofixation. Indeed, when we compare it head to head with SPEP and immunofix, they can detect at the level of 0.2 grams per liter. So anything below that would not be detected by the traditional methods. And therefore we said anything above the blue, the line of 0.2 would be called MGUS, but mass spectrometry MGUS. And anything below that, we wanted to make sure we don't confuse it with the traditional MGUS because otherwise it will cause problems. So we termed it MGIP or monoclonal gamopsy of indeterminate potential a la CHIP, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential knowing that indeed some of those patients may not progress to MGUS and may be related to autoimmune diseases or other low-grade lymphomas and so on, and this needs to be detected further. Now, all of those were confirmed by LCMS. Um, now, with all of this work, we're trying to ask the question, risk stratification, what is the what can lead to progression from MGUS or smoldering myeloma to overt myeloma? So this was published a year ago where we found three alterations, MIC alterations, MAP kinase mutations, and DNA repair mutations that can be added to the 2220 to improve on our risk stratification for patients so that you can indeed tell those patients, not only you have a 50% chance of progression in two years, but now you have a 70, 80% chance of progression, which which gives you that confidence in your risk stratification of patients and indeed making you feel more comfortable that treating early means that you're not over treating certain patients. We've now moved on to do whole genome sequencing, and we can do that in the peripheral blood of patients. So we developed a new method called minimum seek, and this will be out uh, next week in cancer discovery, where you can take minimal numbers of circulating tumor cells, uh, even as low as 30 cells, and you can now do whole genome sequencing by uh, a, a method of low input DNA. And by doing that, you can compare it head to head to fish analysis. And that shows you that indeed whole genome sequencing not not only can give you everything you can find in fish, but you can also do it in the blood rather than doing it in the bone marrow biopsy. And then of course you can get many other things, translocations, all of them, even the ones that were missed by fish, as well as of course copy number alterations and of course somatic mutations. And now you can really prognosticate your patients much better and you can do it at serial levels to look at dynamic disease progression. Now, given that um, our patients, and we're hoping that, and let me go back to this, we're hoping that this will be brought to the clinical level in the near future where we can replace FISH, which is a 50 year old technology, a great technology, but I think we can do better in the near future. Moving on to single cell sequencing, we decided to, we want to look at the inter uh, patient variability rather than the uh, looking at 
all of the patients who have myeloma, we wanted to look at the patients who have MGUS and smoldering myeloma and look at the normal plasma cells within those bone marrow biopsies. So here you're not only looking at interpatient, but you're also looking at the intra-patient variability within each patient, which ones are the normal cells and which ones are the malignant cells. This paper just came out last week, so it's not any more in press. It's actually uh, in nature calm, uh, uh, available right now. And the question is really, why would you care about single cell sequencing? So I borrowed this um, slide from Aviv Regev when she was at the Broad Institute, and it gives you a sense of why single cell sequencing matters. So bulk sequencing, whether it's DNA, RNA, protein, anything, is basically like uh, drinking a smoothie. It tastes very good, but you can tell the differences between a strawberry versus a raspberry. Once you go to single cell sequencing, now you can get it at the level where you can say, this is a mutated raspberry. This is not a very good one. I'm not going to eat it versus others. And hopefully soon we're going to go to spatial transcriptomics where you can look at the whole fruit tart and not just at the single cell sequencing of all the um, fruits together. So by doing that, in bone marrow biopsies of patients who have MGUS and smoldering myeloma, you can detect the normal cells within the same bone marrow versus the malignant cells. And now you can really define what are the early genomic abnormalities that lead to disease progression from normal plasma cells to MGUS, and can you also define targets, so, uh, surface targets on those uh, cells that can be developed for vaccines or by specific antibodies at the early stages of MGUS and smoldering myeloma. You can also look within the myeloma cells or the, within the MGUS cells at the subcluster analysis. So you can see here proliferating cells and other cells. And now you can ask questions of specific therapeutics and how those patients respond or are resistant to those uh, at the single cell level. Now, moving on to immune cell sequencing. Um, we previously showed that even as early as MGUS, you have compositional changes in NK cells, Tregs, and CD16 monocytes, and then further uh, gene expression changes that occur, including uh, granzyme K expressing memory CD8 T cells uh, decreasing in number and granzyme B uh, cells increasing, and then further at the very end, interferon response in those patients. And you can see here that indeed this is reflective on um, the effector T cells being lost, memory cytotoxic effector T cells being lost in many of those patients uh, with progression to myeloma. So Romanos Pistofides just showed us, uh, and this just came out in cancer cell uh, in co collaboration with Marie V and many others, what can we do with single cell immune sequencing in patients who are treated at the smoldering myeloma uh, uh, cases uh, or in a clinical trial? So this is an ilutuzumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone trial in high-risk smoldering myeloma. And we took samples at baseline, at cycle nine, and end of therapy, and we did single cell sequencing in those patients to ask simple questions of what are the mechanisms of response or resistance. And the first two things we found were interesting. The first one is there is a signature of immune reactivity at baseline that can be predictive of response to therapy. So if you have this reactive immune system, you're actually going to respond well to therapy indicating that potentially those cells are ready to engage, but they're a little bit paralyzed rather than completely uh, normal, which would be indicative that they cannot respond to therapy at all. And then the second signature, which was very interesting and we're hoping to expand it further, was the post-immunotherapy normalization, or what I call immune MRD. Post-treatment, when we're looking at MRD, we're looking at the tumor cells alone, yet we're not looking at the immune system. And now we were able to look at the immune system too, to say if it normalized, then you have a predictive value to say that those patients will have a long-term remission. Now, hopefully that can also be applied to myeloma, where you can say immune normalization is predictive for long-term outcome of those patients, and we can combine it with the MRD measurement in many of our patients. So with that in mind, we're now doing many other samples, and hopefully in ASH we will show you soon uh, that we've uh, analyzed over 250 samples where they're both uh, single cell of the immune cells, but also of the tumor cells. And we're indeed looking not only at the bone marrow, but also at the peripheral blood to see if it can be predictive of diagnosing patients uh, with precursor malignancies or not. So can I tell that someone is healthy versus malignant or having precursor at the peripheral blood setting? So this is a... Uh, a Bayesian 
or a naive Bayes classifier that accurately diagnoses patients who have healthy or precursor malignancy in the immune cell sequencing of the bone marrow or peripheral blood in those patients. And then finally, how can you translate that with early interception? This is where we're working with Marie V and many others to take it from the lenalidomide and dexamethasone amazing uh, history that has been changed for smoldering myeloma into more of precision interception in our patients based on immune profiling and based on their genomics. For example, venetoclax in 11 14 translocation and immunotherapy as early as possible to see if we can indeed eradicate the disease with early interception. So this is one of the trials that we have. Um, these are just some of the trials that we have right now at Dana-Farber, including early prevention studies like metformin, intermittent vaccines, intermittent fasting, sorry, vaccines, and so on, and then moving all the way to immunotherapy. And here is one of those studies, immunoprism, that's open right now, and we have six patients on it. It's a platform study randomizing patients to either Lendex, which is the standard of care, versus patients in different arms of bispecific antibodies, teclistamab, telkitamab, and so on, uh, with a primary endpoint of response. Uh, and uh, so far, we've seen minimal cytokine release syndrome in those patients with very uh, significant responses in the early setting of those patients. And then CAR-PRISM is the other trial of using Siltha cell in 20 patients up front in the smoldering setting to see that if you can do it as early as possible, can you potentially eradicate the disease with a one-time uh, CAR T therapy in those high-risk population? So with that, I'll stop here. Um, and I want to thank, of course, lab, clinical members, all our collaborators, all our wonderful work with many others, and of course, Gary Getz at the Broad Institute, uh, and of course, our patients above all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene. We cannot applaud here, but it's okay. Perfect. Yeah, Irene, uh, congratulations, and thank you very much uh, for for your talk and uh, while well, you cover many different aspects uh, basically i would like to start with the first question do you think that we are at the right moment in order to plan screening for m gas or screening for m component in the general population yeah, I think general population, maybe not, because the prevalence would be much lower, but the high risk population, um, and, and again, it's hard to say which ones, but probably African Americans, first degree family members, where you're two to three times higher chance of developing it, potentially, yes. The question is, does it matter? So I think once we truly prove that early interception changes survival of patients, and that's why we need your help, Marivi, to make that happen, then you can argue that early screening and early detection matters. Um, we also probably need to prove, and this is where maybe Nikhil can help us with the IMS, to prove that indeed early interception is more cost effective and better for the patient. So it's not just survival, but it's also the morbidities that happen with those patients once they have renal failure, once they're being transplanted, time off work. There are so many things that we can save by early interception in patients. So I think as a collective work between us as a myeloma community, we could potentially argue that early screening for something like myeloma is probably better than, you know, mammographies and prostate cancer and colonoscopy because the number of patients needed to save lives is actually as high as many of those solid tumors. Yeah, for me it's important and especially in the paper you published the last year in Lancet Dermatology, you did a psychological evaluation to the patients when they received this information and the paper showed that there is not a psychological impact. And for me this is relevant because uh, the screening is good, but well, we have to consider that we are going to give a specific information to, in principle, healthy population, and this can impact in their life. So for me, this is important. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I have or, or one question for you, Irene. Is uh, you have studied the plasma cell in the small in the in the, in the symptomatic phases and also the immune system. Uh, based on that. What do you think is the best? What how can you hypothesize? What is the best treatment for these patients? Cure, control, immunotherapy, more PI, alkylators. Well, what would you think is the best to treat uh, in this smothering phase? 
Well, I think there is no one answer for all. I think multiple myeloma is multiple types of cancer. And um, in a way, we should, if we had our chances of restarting from scratch, and that's why I'm saying that, wouldn't it be amazing if we do actually subclassify the patients? The extremely ultra high risk cytogenetics get certain therapy. The patients with 1114, wouldn't it be nice to kill the early clone that's 1114 with something like venetoclax combinations? And then, of course, I, I personally think that using the immune system as early as possible before you've had, you know, five, six lines of therapy and dexamethasone and all of that would be amazing. And we need to prove that. We need to show that indeed CAR T and bispecific um, can affect certain T cells in an early setting very different than the relapse setting. So in collaboration with many of you, we would like to look at the T cells in an early setting versus, of course, in heavily pretreated patients to say that maybe those patients are the ones who could potentially be cured. Okay, perfect. So I, I actually have a, have a question. Um, thanks very much, Mary V. Irene, I wondered um, whether you have any evidence or have you looked at all to see whether there are any commonly used treatments, for example, in patients with small ring myeloma that can influence the immune signature that you, that you actually show in those patients who have you know, dysfunction of their immune cells? Is there anything that you can shift a patient from that dysfunctional signature towards a, a healthier signature that's associated with a better outcome? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're we're starting to work now with Arlene Sharp and Kai Wuckenberg and many others to really see functionally, can you improve on T-cell function? But since, Michael, you're talking, then it's NK cell. So the question is always, you know, is there a combination of NK T-cell targeting um, and whether you do CRISPR screens or others to identify the specific targets that should be modulated as early as possible? Great. So thank you very much, Irene. I think we have to, to move on to the next one. Thanks a lot for joining us. So we can speak of MRD evaluation in myeloma. So Bruno is one of the leaders about uh, MRD, NGF, and now also NGS in myeloma and other diseases. And so he's working in, in CIMA in the University of Navarra. And so he will, he will speak, about, speak about, about this topic. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. so much. Kiki, for the kind introduction, I uh, I will ask you to confirm if you can see the slide and hear me well. Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay. The the pressure on me is huge because uh, I'm replacing Norma at least for the next twenty minutes, and uh, uh, I'm speaking in between really the top uh, KOL and uh, the, the most experienced people in myeloma. It is really a privilege to be here this afternoon and congratulations on the impressive uh, agenda you prepared for today and I believe for tomorrow as well. Uh, very briefly, 15 minutes, I will talk about MRD evaluation only using next generation sequencing or flow since uh, uh, I believe that uh, Dr. Noemi Push will talk next about the use of mass spec for monitoring myeloma. These are my disclosures. Well, maybe I'm biased, but maybe I'm not. And uh, he can mention that we also work uh, in the field of MRD and other hematological malignancies. And I do believe that myeloma is at the forefront of MRD assessment in malignant hematology with numerous techniques measuring multiple features of disease biology inside and outside the bone marrow. Mass spec that measures the M protein in the serum, Noemi will talk more about this in the next presentation. Next generation flow that measures phenotypically aberrant cells, either in the blood or in the marrow. NGS that measures clonotypic cells, cells having the same clonal immunoglobulin gene sequence, again, both in blood and the marrow, and PET-CT that measures metabolically active cells inside and outside of the bone marrow. Next generation sequencing is probably today the best method on molecular grounds to monitor MRD in myeloma, as well as other hematological malignancies that has shown, I would say, spectacular results in clinical trials in terms of patient prognostication, 
risk stratification and has also shown positive results whenever applied in clinical practice. The same, I would say, applies for next generation flow. I think that when compared to NGS, its application in clinical trials is less frequent, particularly in large multi-center clinical trials with a registration purpose. On the contrary, perhaps on clinical practice, particularly outside of the US, NGF has been applied in many, many different laboratory hospitals that were able to reproduce the same positive results in terms of patient certification that we have seen in clinical trials. Obviously, each technique, and here I will focus particularly on NGF and NGS, has its own set of advantages and disadvantages. And you should choose one or the other based on what are the priorities and those specific advantages. What we have learned in recent years is that in myeloma, and specifically in myeloma, sensitivity is critical. And nowadays, both next-generation tools allow breaching a limit of detection in between 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 6. And this is very important, as I was saying before. The first is because once you compare the two next-generation techniques performing at the peak of their sensitivity, then the correlation between the two is very high, as shown in this study by the Spanish myeloma group, Alejandro Medina from Salamanca, number one, and therefore you can choose one or the other based on other features and not that much the sensitivity of the method. However, and very importantly, sensitivity matters to improve breast stratification. As we can see here, the other ratio for PFS according to 10 to the minus 4, minus 5, and minus 6. And this is why we always endorse, and the International Myeloma Working Group more importantly endorses the use of NGF or NGS for MRD assessment at the cellular level. It, it is no secret that, to some extent, uh, we are, I'm biased, and perhaps the Spanish group is always endorsed um, uh, flow cytometry. Uh, and one of the reasons is uh, the possibility of performing a quality control of the sample in real time. In other words, measuring the extent of hemodilution of the bone marrow aspirate. And last year, Noemi Push and other colleagues, Juan Flore Monteros and many others have shown that when you are performing MRD assessment, it is very important to not only look at myeloma cells, but also other cell types that are specific of the marrow, such as, for example, B cell precursor. Because those patients with a negative MRD result, in whom you may not see as well normal plasma cells and B cell precursors, mast cells or nucleated red cells are at very low frequencies, most likely, this is a non-representative bone marrow aspirate, and the risk of a false negative result is high because these patients are at higher risk of disease progression. I should say that this phenomenon of hemodilution is not equal throughout myeloma treatment and is particularly evident in some treatment scenarios, one of which immediately after CAR T therapy. And in fact, we have shown a few months ago at the International Myeloma Society meeting and updated data will be presented at ASH showing that when we are measuring MRD in patients treated with CAR T cells, while the concordance between NGF and NGS for MRD assessment is usually generally high. Most discordant results are related to samples that are considered as negative by NGS and as hemodiluted 
by next generation flow. And we can see that these samples obviously peak month one after CAR T infusion, but somehow persist during the first year after such infusion. Again, thinking on the concept of monitoring MRD, but also measuring the relative distribution of other cell types, there was an interesting finding while analyzing the MRD data from the phase two KARMA study. And the finding was that when we analyzed patients with a negative MRD result, those that showed reappearance of normal plasma cells at the median PFS as dismal as those patients with positive MRD at the landmark PFS at month one. And if we now analyze as another example, the landmark PFS at month 12, we can see again that negative MRD and reappearance of normal plasma cells shows that these patients show an inferior PFS when compared to those in whom no myeloma and no normal plasma cells are detectable. And we believe that monitoring not only myeloma cells, but also the normal plasma cell compartment is a surrogate for the loss of function and persistence of CAR T cells and a, 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 an alarm for a shorter time until the disease progression. And in fact, I can share with you that in many, if not all of these patients, there was persistence of CAR T, but these were no longer functional and normal BCMA positive plasma cells reappeared at these different landmark points. Obviously, and this was alluded before in the previous presentations, obviously focusing on precursor conditions, we can look beyond the normal plasma cell compartment, analyze, for example, the T cell compartment, nowadays with multi, multi-dimensional and computational flow cytometry that allows dissecting major cell compartments into very small subtypes. And based on all that information, develop immune signatures. In this case, in patients, in, in transplant eligible myeloma patients before maintenance, signatures associated with T cell exhaustion, T cells expressing PD-1, TG, and more that can predict progression-free and overall survival, and that, at least from a statistical point of view, are not associated with patients MRD status, and therefore, could potentially be complementary. Now, the other aspect that, in my opinion, is an advantage of working with a fresh sample and thereby relying on NGF to monitor MRD is to isolate the MRD clone whenever MRD is persistent and try to characterize its biology to understand MRD resistance. And last year we published in blood that if you do this exercise in patients with standard and high risk cytogenetics, and after isolating the patient specific MRD clone, perform RNA and all exome sequencing and compare the fingerprints of the MRD clone with the patient matched tumor cell diagnosis, we started to understand why, despite similar MRD level, PFS is completely different for patients with standard and high risk cytogenetic abnormalities. And this is not related to the amount of persistent MRD. MRD levels were more or less the same, but we are seeing different pathways of MRD resistance with an enrichment of the ROS pathway in patients with high risk cytogenetic abnormalities. And generally speaking, a preserved genetic uh, composition from diagnosis to MRD and relapse stages. Another interesting phenomenon that eventually nowadays may not be that relevant, but could be in the future when more and more targeted therapies become available to treat pa patients with cancer and here specifically myeloma, 
is that we found volatility in potentially actionable mutations. In other words, for example, this patient here with high risk cytogenetic abnormalities show the mutation in NRA the diagnosis that was absent in the MRD clone and vice versa for a mutation in KRAS. And therefore, targeted therapies for MRD positive patients may require the reassessment of genetic alterations in sorted MRD clones. Finally, I would like to address the topic of assessment of MRD in peripheral blood. This is data from our French colleagues published already four years ago in blood advances using NGS, the same method as adaptive in plasma from patients with myeloma after treatment. And mm, our colleague, French colleagues showed a partial correlation with the marrow with 44% false negative results in blood, those that you can see here. Now, this is the data from the Euroflow Consortium using NGF, almost identical to NGS, with a partial correlation with 40% false negative results in blood. In other words, using either NGS or NGF nowadays in blood is less sensitive when compared to the marrow in the same patient population. However, according to the Euroflow Consortium, you can see in the slide that whenever you detect MRD in blood, it is prognostically relevant in the whole myeloma patient cohort. It continues to be prognostically relevant in those patients with in stringent or conventional CR and becomes particularly prognostic when you perform it sequentially. And that is the advantage of blood. Being minimally invasive, you can test whenever you want. And based on these promising results, in the past few years, we have been developing a, a new iteration of NGF that includes prior enrichment using max of large volumes of peripheral blood that allow us to, to reach a limited detection of 10 to the minus seven, and even in some patients, 10 to the minus eight, and this data will be presented as an oral abstract at ASH in a few weeks' time. And by using this iteration of the NGF method, we can see MRD twice more frequently when compared to the standard NGF approach. And by increasing the sensitivity, by covering the logarithmic range of 10 to the minus 7, even reaching 10 to the minus 8 in good quality blood samples, we are, the, we are increasing sensitivity, decreasing the negative product or predictive value when compared to the marrow, and reaching very, very promising patient prognostication in peripheral blood. Therefore, and to conclude, I do believe that using either NGS or NGF there is a clear role for MRD assessment in the bone marrow using this standardized optimal method. And time will tell in the future if by using these methods or even more sensitive ones, we can establish a role for MRD assessment in peripheral blood as we are seeing the emerging role of monitoring CTCs in patients with active disease. I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bruno, for, this, for the great talk, as usual. I have a question, Bruno, if possible. And apologies because I arrived a bit later, because a bit later, because I, I was attending a patient. But, uh, well, you put a slide with a minimal residual disease actor CAR T with three different curves. And, uh, well, this is something very realistic we see in the clinic because uh, when you start to monitor a patient after CAR T at the beginning, majority of the patients are in MRT negative and you don't see any plasma cell, any malignant, any benign, and severe immunoparesia. And for me, the situation, the critical situation starts when you see the patient starts to recover the immunoglobulins. This means that, that uh, normal plasma cells are starting 
to be present in the bone marrow. And I always uh, consider since this moment, I think that the risk for progression can start. So I would like to, to ask you, do you consider that the curve in the middle, so that it was uh, light blue, is uh, the realistic uh, curve in terms of evaluating the minimal residual disease in CAR-T because the dark blue in which well, the PFS is a flat, I think that it is not completely realistic because want, what we want when we treat patients with CAR-T is to have a normal bone marrow. And in this moment, we can evaluate the MRD. So I, I don't know what is your thought about this. I, I, I completely agree. Uh, and in fact, you, in, in, I, I think it is not on purpose, but you almost embarrass me because you, you were saying that we don't need all this fancy technology. You can actually measure only the immunoglobulin levels. No, 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 no. I know, I know. But I think that you are very much correct. And to some extent, it is the, perhaps the price to pay for the efficacy of these uh, immunotherapies eventually at the beginning also associated with toxicity, namely CRS, and at intermediate and late stages, hypogammaglobinemia, immune impairment, and the risk of infection. And you know that while these are there, these therapies are being effective and are depleting both normal and myeloma cells. And when you start to see normal, unless you have eliminated all clones or are only left with benign ones, it will be only a matter of time until myeloma cells start, start growing again. Exactly, but well, my point is maybe at the beginning, we can potentially overestimate the MRD negativity rate after CAR-T. And for me, this is a yeah. problem because we can be extremely optimistic. Yeah, at, at the beginning, I, I would say that it's quite challenging, particularly during the first three months, three months, to measure what was the efficacy of the CAR T infusion. Because you are absolutely right, there is an overestimation of MRD negative results, particularly because of poor quality samples. And on the other side of response assessment, the M protein, there is infraestimation because the long half life of immunoglobulins are decreasing the number of patients that may already be in complete remission, but uh, will take a few more months to reach that, uh, that criterion. Thank you. Also going to ask you about that, because have you seen if there is, if this uh, increase in normal plasma cells precedes the loss of CAR T? So is there any correlation between, I mean, if, what is first? Probably it's first that you are losing the CAR T's, or the other way around, or another another uh, way of doing that. Have you seen if some of these patients that still that increases the normal plasma cells, they still have some of them still have CAR T's or not? So, generally speaking, and, and theoretically, perhaps one would think on peak expansion, exhaustion, and disappearance of CAR T. Now, these patients that are MRD negative, and we specifically look for MRD negative because if it's positive, the time to this progression is only a few months. It's a, it's a very poor prognostic feature. We were specifically, specifically looking to MRD negative, and these are favorable prognosis patients. And therefore, in this subset of patients being MRD negative at month six and 12, there was in fact persistence of CAR -Ts that may explain the longer PFS and the longer remission. So it was a hallmark of loss of functionality rather than lack of persistence. Okay. Okay, very good, interesting. Well, I want to ask you about the peripheral blood because for me, I mean, this is quite appealing to see if we can measure MRD in peripheral. We have been speaking about liquid biopsy for a long time, and, and well, that's now very attractive and very fancy. But you, you are, we are seeing in this case some liquid liquid biopsy. Right? We are seeing. Do you see that in the future? That what would be real the future of this or the, 
the applicability of this? Yes, I, I, I do think there is a future. Um, while I was saying at the beginning of the presentation that in my opinion, myeloma is at the forefront of MRD in hematology, it is also true that myeloma is a complex disease and perhaps more complex to monitor than others. And therefore, the future that I dream of is a future where at the beginning, particularly during induction, intensification, you would still require the bone marrow for MRD assessment, but at intermediate and late stages, and particularly if treatment is not until the disease progression in newly diagnosed patients, you can really part bone marrows and replace that by more frequent MRD assessment in peripheral blood. But again, because of the complexity of myeloma, I would foresee that a very effective and sensitive MRT assessment in blood would rely on both the M protein, and Noemi will talk next about mass spectrometry as the most sensitive method to, to monitor the M protein and the cellular method. And I truly hope that if not in all, in a subset of patients and at specific stages of treatment, the marrow can be safely replaced by blood and monitoring these two aspects of disease biology in blood. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Bruno. And uh, well, what is your opinion? I, I definitely, I agree with you. And I think that uh, mass spectrometry with uh, circulating to more cells, uh, well, should be done frequently in a peripheral gland, uh, blood. And we have just analyzed our gene Cesar study. And uh, well, we've seen how majority of the biochemical progressions were detected by M component in the serum because the bone marrow were done once per year. So many potential biochemical relapse will occur, but you are not going to be able to detect them if you do bone marrow every year and you can do a bone marrow every month. What is your opinion about the free DNA in the peripheral blood? This technique can complement the other ones or definitely we should forget it? No, no, by all means. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that uh, measuring uh, persistent disease at the DNA level is very, very attractive if you go beyond the VDJ sequence and you don't know, not only monitor if there is persistence or resurgence of the disease, but also the genetic composition of those myeloma clones. And here is where I think that technology is still at is still in the limit. There are techniques, as you know, that can characterize genetic alterations in plasma, but the majority of those techniques is not sensitive enough to move away from diagnosis or patients with active disease where, where they have showed their performance into MRD states. But I'm sure it's a matter of time till those techniques, technologies become more sensitive and then potentially can be equally applied at MRD stages. Thank you very much, Bruno. Okay, thank you. So we should now uh, move to, I think, Norma. Muchas gracias por invitarme. En los próximos minutos vamos a, a revisar los aspectos que me parecen más relevantes de la genética del mieloma múltiple. Eh, estos son mis conflictos de interés. El, el mieloma múltiple es una enfermedad eh, heterogénea desde el punto de vista clínico, no solo porque hay pacientes que pueden vivir más de 15 años y otros, en cambio, tener eh, supervivencias cortas, no más de, de tres años, sino porque dentro de los pacientes que viven poco tiempo, algunos han llegado a alcanzar remisión completa y dentro de los largos supervivientes, algunos pacientes nunca alcanzan remisión completa. Eso quiere decir que el paciente es capaz de, de convivir con las células plasmáticas sin que le cause daño orgánico. Eh, hay muchos factores que pueden influir en esta heterogeneidad de, del mieloma múltiple, pero sin duda el más determinante y el que está más estudiado es la diversidad genómica. 
Gracias al desarrollo de las eh, técnicas genómicas en los últimos años que permiten analizar el genoma completo sin necesidad de metafases, llegando a resoluciones de un par de bases y también a la utilización de herramientas que separan y purifican las células plasmáticas, eh, se ha conseguido tener un mapa bastante completo de las alteraciones del mieloma múltiple, que se pueden categorizar en tres tipos, alteraciones en el número de copias o lo que es lo mismo ganancias y pérdidas cromosómicas, eh, traslocaciones y mutaciones puntuales. Para cada una de estas alteraciones existe una eh, técnica gol estándar para identificarlas, para identificar la, la ganancia y pérdida cromosómica, lo ideal es hacerlo mediante CGH RISE o SNIP RISE, que es una técnica un poquito más moderna, para detectar las traslocaciones mediante hibridación in situ fluorescente. Y para detectar las mutaciones puntuales se puede hacer con tecnología Sanger, pero en la actualidad lo ideal es hacerlo con las eh, técnicas de, de NGS. Eh, si nos fijamos en primer lugar en las ganancias y pérdidas cromosómicas, podemos decir que prácticamente todos los mielomas múltiples son anormales. Como veis en la diapositiva, cualquier mieloma se puede afectar por alteraciones numéricas o estructurales y lo más frecuente son las trisomías de los cromosomas impares las alteraciones del cromosoma 1, eh, sobre todo ganancias de 1Q y las pérdidas del cromosoma 13. En cuanto a las traslocaciones, es bien conocido que las traslocaciones de IgH se observan casi en el 50 o 60% de los pacientes con mieloma. La más frecuente es la traslocación 11-14 que involucra la ciclina de 1 y casi le sigue en frecuencia la traslocación 4-14 que desregula dos genes a la vez, FGFR3 y NSD2 y en menor frecuencia otras traslocaciones que implican a otros oncogenes. Es importante recordar que la traslocación 414 y la traslocación 1416 son crípticas y no se ven en el cariotipo y necesitan FIS o otro, otro, otro tipo de, de técnicas. Cuando, llegó la, las técnicas de, cuando llegaron a los laboratorios las, las técnicas de NGS, los análisis de whole genome sequencing y de, y de exon sequencing re, revelaron en otras eh, patologías eh, mutaciones características. En cambio, en el mieloma múltiple se vio que el porcentaje mayor de mutaciones correspondía a las mutaciones en los oncogenes RAS, que era algo ya conocido, y el resto de mutaciones tenía una frecuencia mucho menor por debajo del, del 10%. Eh, aunque es verdad que se descubrieron algunos genes cuyas mutaciones no se conocían que estuvieran implicadas en mieloma múltiple y eh, últimamente están apareciendo estudios para averiguar cuál es su implicación en el mieloma. Uno de ellos es FAN46C, que es una, polia no canónica, una polimerasa polia no canónica que incrementa la expresión génica porque extiende las colas polia de los RNA mensajeros y se ha visto que su pérdida promueve la supervivencia del mieloma y nosotros en el laboratorio también hemos observado que eh, su knockout pro provoca migración de las células plasmáticas, por tanto podría tratarse de un gen supresor tumoral. Eh, la ventaja de la NGS es que además de eh, identificar mutaciones eh, puntuales en, en genes, es capaz de detectar también la ganancia y pérdida de material genético y también las traslocaciones. Por tanto, sería una técnica que sería capaz de eh, identificar todas las, lo, todos los tipos de alteraciones que se observan en el mieloma múltiple. Y eso ha permitido eh, ver, por ejemplo, que las alteraciones del oncogen MIC son mucho más frecuentes de lo que se creía cuando solo se, se analizaban por FIS o por CGH RISE. Si se utilizan técnicas de, de, de secuenciación completa del genoma, eh, se ha visto que eh, las alteraciones del oncogen MIC están, eh, superan el 40% de los casos y que la FIS perdería aproximadamente un 70% de esas alteraciones. Pasaría por alto, quiero decir, un 70% de esas alteraciones. Eh, también es bien conocido, pero conviene recordar lo que la mayor parte de estas alteraciones están presentes ya en el estado de, de engas sobre todo las eh, trisomías y algunas de las traslocaciones. Cuando eh, el pequeño porcentaje de engas se transforma a mieloma, lo que ocurre es que aparecen diferentes clones en los que hay otras alteraciones secundarias que van emergiendo con el tiempo y estos clones con distintas alteraciones se van seleccionando fundamentalmente con los tratamientos. 
Eh, se sabe, ya desde hace tiempo hay numerosos estudios que indican que algunas de estas alteraciones genéticas tienen un impacto en el pronóstico. Fundamentalmente, las ganancias de 1Q y las amplificaciones, las deleciones de 1P y las pérdidas de 17P en cuanto a los eh, desequilibrios genómicos se eh, caracterizan por tener mal, mal pronóstico. En las traslocaciones, la traslocación 414 y la traslocación 1416 se han asociado generalmente con pronóstico desfavorable, aunque es cierto que que los esquemas que utilizan inhibidores del proteasoma parecen revertir ese pronóstico. Y en cuanto a las mutaciones, las mutaciones de P53, todos los estudios reproducen que se asocian con mal pronóstico. En la actualidad, la revisión del ISS, el R2 ISS, incorpora las ganancias de 1Q porque matizan mejor el, el pronóstico de los pacientes asociado a las otras alteraciones que ya estaban incorporadas, como son la 414 y la delección de 17P. Me voy a detener eh, breves minutos eh, en, en las alteraciones de, de 1Q y de 17P. Como veis en la diapositiva, las alteraciones de, del cromosoma 1 son muy características, cuando se altera el, el brazo largo del cromosoma 1 siempre se gana y cuando se altera el brazo corto lo normal es que se pierda. Se sabía desde hace tiempo que las ganancias de 1Q se asociaban con, con mal pronóstico y también se vio posteriormente que las deleciones de, de 1P tenían un pronóstico muy desfavorable y además se acaba de confirmar, lo acaba de confirmar también el grupo francés con otro set de, de pacientes. Eh, en un estudio eh, extenso de, de, las altera de, de secuenciación de nueva generación, eh, whole genome sequencing y exoma, se, se vio que lo que tenía realmente peor pronóstico eran las amplificaciones de, no, de 1Q, o lo que es lo mismo, las eh, ganancias, eh, o sea, la, la, el tener más de, de tres copias, el tener cuatro o más copias, como veis en la curva. Eh, esta alteración junto con un ISS de 3 es uno de los dos conceptos que hay de mieloma doble hit. El otro, la otra definición que se ha acuñado como doble hit, es la presencia concomitante de delección y mutación de P53. Eh, hay dos estudios que demuestran que el tener las dos alteraciones a la vez implica un pronóstico muy desfavorable y en cambio solamente tener la delección no parece que acarre mal pronóstico. No obstante, en una serie amplia de pacientes publicada por el grupo francés poniendo el dintel de delección de 17P en el 55%, se observa que eh, es cierto que la mutación más de lección es lo que realmente contribuye a un pronóstico muy desfavorable, pero como veis en las curvas, solo tener la delección de 17P se asocia realmente también con mal pronóstico. Y es muy importante tener en cuenta que eh, la asociación o la, la presencia de más de una alteración de mal pronóstico va ensombreciendo cada vez más el pronóstico hasta el punto de que tener eh, tres de estas alteraciones de mal pronóstico, estos pacientes tienen una mediana de supervivencia en torno a, a nueve meses. Toda la diversidad genética que observamos en el DNA se traslada, como es lógico, al RNA. Y esto es algo que se ha, ha quedado muy patente con los estudios del ensayo COMPAS pro, promovido por la MMRF, en el que han participado cuatro países, entre ellos España, en el que se analizan más de mil pacientes con técnicas de NGS, no solo del DNA, sino también mediante RNA-SEC. Y como veis en la diapositiva, pues existen varios grupos de pacientes con una firma genética característica que se asocia muchas de las veces con una de las alteraciones eh, genéticas, bien con las traslocaciones eh, 4-14, con la 14-16, con la 11-14, pero me gustaría destacar sobre todo esta firma proliferativa, eh, abreviada como PR, que son muy pocos pacientes, eh, apenas el 7% de los pacientes, pero que pueden aparecer, como veis en la diapositiva, en cualquier grupo genético y se caracterizan por tener un índice proliferativo alto y un pronóstico muy, muy desfavorable. Finalmente, eh, la heterogeneidad genética pasaría del RNA a la proteína, pero como todos sabéis, el estudio de las proteínas es mucho más complejo y es difícil hacer estudios de, de, de espectrometría de, de masas eh, a nivel de, de, to de todo el conjunto de las proteínas de, de cada paciente porque se necesitaría bastante muestra. 
Nosotros en el laboratorio hemos adquirido una plataforma que es eh, un, un, un western simple, es un poco la definición, que hace los western en un capilar. Entonces la ventaja que tiene es que utiliza muy poca muestra y permite analizar muchas proteínas por paciente. Eso nos ha permitido analizar eh, las proteínas implicadas en los mecanismos de, de resistencia del bortezomid, de la en los mecanismos de acción perdón, del bortezomid, el reblimid y, y la dexametasona, en el ensayo del GEM, GEM, del GEM 2012 que utilizaba este régimen de, indu de inducción, el VRD, y eso nos permitió observar cómo eh, los altos niveles de IRF4 se asocian con mejor pronóstico, eso ya también lo habían descrito en, alguna otra, en algún otro estudio, y en cambio los altos niveles de ícaros y PSMD10 se asociaban con, con peor pronóstico en pacientes tratados con este esquema terapéutico. Por tanto, la, la genómica implica no solo el análisis del DNA, debe ser un análisis mucho más completo, mucho más eh, integral, en el que se analice el flujo de información desde el DNA al RNA y finalmente a la proteína. Para eso es muy importante eh, guardar muestra, almacenar muestra después de hacer los estudios eh, protocolizados y de la práctica asistencial, congelar muestra para poder, para poder extraer simultáneamente de DNA, RNA y proteína y hacer los estudios eh, genómicos posteriores y sobre todo estudios genómicos a gran escala. Pero el tener este tipo de muestras también permite eh, no solo hacer estudios genómicos a gran escala, sino también centrarse en diseccionar el papel de algunos genes en concreto, por ejemplo, de P53. No solo centrarse en lo que ocurre en el, en el DNA, sino también analizar las isoformas de P53, los reguladores, las dianas de P53, analizar cada gen en profundidad. En este sentido, eh, siempre es, ha, ha sido un tema controvertido eh, si los niveles de P53 influyen en el pronóstico. Nosotros lo analizamos en el ensayo en 2012 y vimos que no, se, no había diferencias entre los pacientes que tenían altos y bajos niveles de P53 y que incluso estos niveles tampoco eh, se correlacionaban bien con tener delección o no tener delección de P53. Y eso probablemente esté relacionado con que P53 está formado por múltiples isoformas algunas de ellas truncadas que pierden los, los dominios de trasactivación y por tanto los efectos eh, patogénicos pueden ser distintos. Y en el mieloma múltiple casi todos los pacientes expresan P53 y casi todos a expensas de las isoformas largas o de las TEA que tienen los dominios de trasactivación. En cambio las isoformas cortas se expresan en muy pocos pacientes y lo que vimos es que los pacientes que tenían altos niveles de isoformas cortas tienen eh, mejor supervivencia que los que, que los que tienen niveles bajos de isoformas cortas. Y al revés, aquellos pacientes con isoformas largas TA, que tienen los dominios de trasactivación, cuantos más altos sean esos niveles de estas isoformas, la supervivencia es, más, eh, es, más, eh, es menor. Y eso es importante sobre todo porque cuando combinamos el riesgo citogenético con los niveles de expresión de las isoformas, observamos que eh, los pacientes de alto riesgo, aquí en rojo, que tenían altos niveles de isoformas cortas, tenían una supervivencia igual que los de riesgo estándar. En cambio, los pacientes, eh, en este caso el, la, la línea en, en naranja, el grupo 3, que eran también de alto riesgo, pero que tenían niveles bajos de las isoformas que en teoría se asocian con mal pronóstico, pues también al final tenían un pronóstico parecido a los de riesgo estándar. En definitiva, que los niveles de isoformas de P53 pueden modificar el riesgo citogenético de los pacientes con mieloma múltiple. También nos hemos centrado en el laboratorio en, otras, en otro aspecto de, del gen P53 y es que Llama un poco la atención que a pesar de su importancia en el pronóstico, su incidencia en el momento del diagnóstico es muy, es muy infrecuente. Eh, realmente la inactivación vialélica de lección más mutación no supera ni el 4% de los, de los pacientes. Por eso nos planteamos tratar de, de investigar si eh, la firma transcripcional de estos pacientes doble HIT de P53 podría encontrarse en otros pacientes que no tuvieran ninguna alteración a nivel del gen de P53. Para eso aprovechamos los datos de la serie COMPAS y eh, estudiamos las firmas genéticas de las alteraciones más importantes 
y eh, fuimos sustrayendo estas firmas genéticas hasta quedarnos en exclusiva con la firma genética del doble hit de P53. Y después buscamos si esa firma estaba presente en otros pacientes. Esta firma quedaba definida por la expresión de 78 genes y eran pacientes que sin tener ninguna alteración en el gen de P53 sí que tenían una firma genética prácticamente idéntica a los que tenían de lección y mutación. A partir de esa firma se generó un score, eh, seleccionamos eh, los que más expresaban del score, el cuartil 1, y buscamos ese, ese nivel de expresión en los pacientes que no tenían alteraciones en P53. Y como veis en la gráfica, estos pacientes que estarían al mismo nivel del Q1, que son 50, serían pacientes que tienen la misma firma, firma genética que los doble hit de P53 sin tener esas alteraciones. Y lo curioso fue ver que la eh, supervivencia de estos pacientes en, en naranja es muy desfavorable, incluso peor que los pacientes doble hit de P53. Y para terminar, me gustaría hacer hincapié en que la genética también eh, puede ser importante y debería ser importante a la hora de identificar biomarcadores mm, eh, más que pronósticos, predictivos. Porque si nos quedamos en el pronóstico, pues solamente sabremos si, esa, si esos grupo de mielomas tiene más probabilidad de recaer o de, o de progresar. Pero yo creo que el objetivo fundamental ahora es saber qué pacientes van a responder a determinados tratamientos para de alguna forma administrar a esos pacientes una medicina personalizada. Y la genómica creo que es la herramienta fundamental para ir analizando ese, ese tipo de, de, de alteraciones y ver los pacientes que, que responden y no responden a los distintos tratamientos. Muchas gracias por escucharme. Muchas gracias, Norma, por la presentación. Muy educacional, como siempre. Pues yo tenía una pregunta, bueno, voy a hacer una pregunta rápida y es, eh, no tenía que, pero bueno, una. Has, eh, hay, has, hemos mostrado que, has mostrado que hay unos grupos de pacientes que tienen un perfil de P53, de mutación de P53, pero no tienen mutación de P53. Sí, ¿no? exacto. Eso es. ¿Y por qué, a qué, por qué tienen ese perfil? O sea, a mí esto siempre me ha, cuando yo vi esto al principio, ¿no? me, siempre me ha sorprendido, ¿no? ¿Por qué esos pacientes tienen un perfil de mutación de P53 sin tenerlo, no? Mm. Yo le explico, vamos, le, le, le encuentro eh, dos posibles explicaciones, que a lo mejor hay más. Una sería que algunas de las otras a, alteraciones, a lo mejor eh, de mal pronóstico, eh, pueden desregular vías comunes con las que desregula P53. Y la otra explicación que, que encuentro es que eh, P53 esté alterado eh, por debajo del DNA. Quiero decir que a nivel de, del RNA pues haya otro tipo de, de alteración, no claro. sé si algún micro RNA que lo silencie o, o otro tipo de, de alteraciones que al final la proteína no, no tenga la capacidad de actuar como, como en condiciones normales. Eso es lo que se me ocurre a mí que puede estar pasando. Perfecto. Pues muy bien. Pues nada, yo creo que pasamos... Bueno, muchas gracias siguiente. y perdón por los problemas técnicos. En absoluto. Muchas gracias, Norma. Entonces, a continuación, pues Noemí, ¿no? Noemí Puch eh, nos hablará de, de las nuevas técnicas proteómicas, ¿no? Espectrometría, además, es fundamentalmente como una nueva técnica de, bueno, de evaluación de la, de la enfermedad del front tumoral en el caso del mieloma, ¿no? El componente monoclonal. Eh, muchas gracias por, por la invitación y gracias también a los patrocinadores por hacer posible este evento. Y eh, bueno, pues eso, lo que, lo que ha dicho Quique, que vamos a comentar un poco eh, bueno, los resultados que tenemos eh, principalmente del Grupo Español de Mieloma sobre eh, bueno, pues, eh, nueva, pro, nuevos estudios proteómicos en pacientes con mieloma múltiple. Estos son mis conflictos de interés. Eh, bueno, pues eh, empezar diciendo que, que la electroforesis y la inmunofijación pues, a día de hoy siguen siendo elementos fundamentales en el diagnóstico y en el seguimiento de los pacientes con mieloma múltiple y utilizando la electroforesis y la inmunofijación siguiendo los criterios del Grupo Internacional de Mieloma, pues a día de hoy una gran parte de nuestros pacientes alcanzan eh, tasas de respuesta muy elevadas y gran parte de ellos pues respuestas completas. Puede ser que, que por esta razón y por otras, pues los criterios de respuesta estándar del Grupo Internacional de Mieloma a día de hoy en determinados momentos del tratamiento, como pueden ver en la diapositiva post-consolidación, pues han dejado de tener valor pronóstico. 
También por esto, pues desde hace unos años se está investigando la presencia de enfermedad residual más allá de la respuesta completa, lo que se ha llamado enfermedad mínima residual dentro de la médula ósea, utilizando eh, técnicas de citometría de flujo, ASO, PCR o Next Generation Sequencing y también fuera de la médula ósea utilizando técnicas de imagen como es la PET. De nuevo, utilizando los criterios de enfermedad mínima residual que definió el Grupo Internacional de Mieloma en el año 2016, pues a día de hoy sabemos por este y por otros muchos estudios que eh, alcanzar enfermedad mínima residual negativa en pacientes con mieloma en diferentes circunstancias, pacientes elegibles para trasplante, no elegibles para trasplante, así como pacientes en recaída o refractarios, pues tiene un valor pronóstico muy importante tanto en términos de supervivencia libre de progresión como en términos de supervivencia global. Sin embargo, también es cierto que el análisis de la enfermedad mínima residual en la médula ósea de los pacientes con mieloma tiene ciertas limitaciones debido a que obtener una muestra de médula ósea requiere un procedimiento invasivo que no puede realizarse con frecuencia y, de, y además debido a la posibilidad de falsos negativos relacionados con la característica infiltración parcheada del mieloma, así como con la posible presencia de enfermedad extramedular. Digamos que una alternativa pues, ideal a la médula ósea sería el uso de sangre periférica para analizar la enfermedad mínima residual y en ese sentido pues, la sangre periférica se está utilizando a día de hoy, se está analizando a día de hoy mediante citometría de flujo, mediante técnicas de Next Generation Sequencing y también mediante espectrometría de masas como fuente para analizar la enfermedad mínima residual en pacientes con mielo. ¿En qué se basa el uso de la espectrometría de masas para diagnosticar y seguir a los pacientes con mieloma múltiple con otras gamapatías monoclonales? Pues se basa en el hecho de que el componente monoclonal de cada paciente tiene una masa molecular específica derivada a su vez del reordenamiento específico de la cadena pesada de las inmunoglobulinas del que procede y al mismo tiempo, debido a que la espectrometría de masas es capaz de identificar esta masa molecular con una gran precisión, con una gran exactitud, de manera que estas dos características combinadas pues, hacen que la espectrometría de masas sea una técnica digamos, eh, óptima pues, para, tanto para diagnosticar como especialmente para seguir el componente monoclonal de los pacientes con mieloma con una gran sensibilidad y con una gran especificidad. Hay diferentes métodos para, para hacer esto, es decir, para aplicar la espectrometría de masas en el seguimiento de los pacientes con mieloma y otras gamapatías monoclonales. En nuestros estudios hemos utilizado esta aproximación que se le ha llamado de cadena ligera intacta, más sencilla, pero también eh, bueno, más aplicable en la rutina diaria y también pues, menos sensible. Pero hemos de saber que hay otras aproximaciones, como, el, eh, como la de esta eh, que se llama del péptido clonotípico, que básicamente lo que hace es analizar muy pequeños fragmentos del componente monoclonal del paciente, eh, pero que requieren una preparación de las muestras mucho más compleja, un, un procedimiento mucho más laborioso y eh, bueno, que sí que es verdad que se asocian con una mayor sensibilidad. En nuestros estudios, como digo, hemos utilizado la aproximación de la cadena ligera libre completa y eh, específicamente en los estudios del GEM hemos utilizado tres, eh, tres aproximaciones. La primera y más simple que eh, utilizaba solo las, eh, las esferas anti-IgG, anti-IgA, anti-IgM y las de cadena ligera capa y cadena, cadena ligera total capa y lambda. En un segundo paso añadimos al análisis las, las esferas y por tanto también el análisis de las cadenas ligeras libres en suero y finalmente hemos eh, incluido en el, en, el, en el análisis una cromatografía líquida previa al procedimiento completo que como veremos posteriormente lo que hace es incrementar la sensibilidad del método. La mayor parte de nuestros estudios eh, eh, se han llevado a cabo en el, en el, en el, en conte, en el contexto del GEM 2012 menos de 65, que es un protocolo, como saben, para pacientes jóvenes con mieloma múltiple, candidatos a trasplante, que incluye seis ciclos de inducción con VRD, trasplante con melfalán 200 o con busulfán melfalán y dos ciclos de consolidación con VRD. Y en el contexto de este ensayo hemos analizado el componente monoclonal en suero mediante las técnicas convencionales, es decir, mediante electroforesis y inmunofilación y también mediante espectrometría de masas y hemos analizado la enfermedad mínima residual en médula ósea mediante Next Generation Flow al diagnóstico, posinducción, post trasplante y posconsolidación. Entonces, ¿qué hemos encontrado al diagnóstico de la comparación de los resultados de la, de la espectrometría de masas con los de las técnicas convencionales, es decir, con los de la electroforesis y la inmunofijación? 
Pues en el momento del diagnóstico vimos que la aplicación de la espectrometría de masas, incluyendo el análisis de las cadenas ligeras libres en suero, nos permitía identificar la presencia de un componente monoclonal en cuatro pacientes que se habían considerado no secretores, eh, verdaderos no secretores, utilizando las técnicas convencionales, es decir, utilizando electroforesis, inmunofijación y también las cadenas ligeras libres en suero. Esto ya lo había descrito el grupo francés en un paper eh, hace unos meses en el que eh, los autores eh, describen que en, en un 91% de los pacientes incluidos en el estudio y considerados verdaderos no secretores, la aplicación de la espectrometría de masas tipo Malditov eh, bueno, fue suficiente para identificar y para cuantificar la presencia de un componente monoclonal en estos pacientes, eh, lo cual eh, bueno, pues, eh, facilita eh, el seguimiento de estos pacientes que de otra manera pues, necesitarían eh, aspirados de médula ósea periódicos o, o técnicas de imagen para, para monitorizarse después de recibir el tratamiento y además y una cosa importante es que permitiría la inclusión de estos pacientes en ensayos clínicos en los que bueno, pues a día de hoy si no tienen enfermedad medible pues no pueden incluirse. También vimos que eh, bueno, pues los resultados en cuanto al isotipo del componente monoclonal de los pacientes, eh, los resultados eh, de la espectrometría de masas, incluyendo las cadenas ligeras libres en suero y las técnicas convencionales, la inmunofijación, pues eran completamente superponibles en más del 80% de los casos y que eh, las discordancias, entre comillas, se debieron a que en una proporción pequeña de casos eh, el, el uso de la espectrometría de masas permitía identificar, además del, digamos, del pico principal que veíamos con las, con las técnicas convencionales, algunos picos eh, adicionales que eh, también en una proporción pequeña de casos eh, eran los únicos biomarcadores que permanecían en las muestras de seguimiento de los pacientes, de nuevo bueno, pues, permitiendo que estos pacientes pudieran monitorizarse con ese ese biomarcador extra que era capaz de identificar la espectrometría de masas en el momento del diagnóstico. Eso en el momento del diagnóstico. Entonces, ¿qué hemos aprendido de comparar los resultados de, eh, bueno, de la identificación del componente monoclonal en suero mediante técnicas convencionales y mediante espectrometría de masas post-inducción, post-trasplante y post-consolidación? Pues, bueno, la primera idea es que la aplicación de la espectrometría de masas permitía identificar la presencia de, eh, de enfermedad, es decir, del componente monoclonal en una proporción superior de pacientes comparado con las técnicas convencionales, como pueden ver en la diapositiva en los tres momentos que hemos analizado, es decir, posinducción, post trasplante y posconsolidación. Ya hemos comentado al principio que eh, la electroforesis, la inmunofijación, posconsolidación no discriminaba diferentes grupos, de diferentes grupos de pacientes en términos de supervivencia libre de progresión, es decir, que no mantenía su valor pronóstico, mientras que, como pueden ver, los resultados de la espectrometría de masas mantenían este valor pronóstico en términos de supervivencia libre de progresión en los tres momentos que analizamos y lo que es más importante lo que vimos es que en los pacientes en los que no se identificaba la presencia de un componente monoclonal utilizando las técnicas convencionales, es decir, en pacientes con inmunofijación negativa o en respuesta completa, la espectrometría de masa será capaz de discriminar dos grupos de pacientes con diferente supervivencia libre de progresión de alguna manera confirmando que la sensibilidad extra de la espectrometría de masas se asociaba con un valor pronóstico, con un valor clínico en términos de supervivencia libre de progresión en pacientes en respuesta completa. En este momento recordar eh, un aspecto de la espectrometría de masas que, que, que es relevante a día de hoy porque eh, bueno, pues, eh, el uso de anticuerpos monoclonales terapéuticos a día de hoy bueno, pues, eh, es, es, está generalizado en todas las líneas de tratamiento de los pacientes con mieloma y como saben pues el uso de estos anticuerpos monoclonales terapéuticos puede representar eh, un problema a la hora de evaluar la respuesta puesto que aparecen en la electroforesis como bandas eh, bueno, pues, iguales a las del componente monoclonal del paciente y por lo tanto puede de dificultar la evaluación de la respuesta. Entonces, el propio fundamento de la espectrometría de masas pues, eh, hace que eh, permita la diferenciación entre el componente monoclonal del paciente y el componente monoclonal terapéutico, que como ven, eh, bueno, pues, eh, se ha comprobado que es posible pues, en, en el 100% de los casos, en el estudio que reflejo en esta diapositiva, cuando, se, cuando se, lo que se analizó fue dar a tu momabo el otuzumab, y de la misma manera en este estudio eh, que reflejo en esta diapositiva, pues, en el 100% de los casos, cuando también eh, el tratamiento de los pacientes incluía isatuximab. 
Entonces, volviendo al análisis de, de, de la enfermedad mínima residual en pacientes con mieloma, pues hasta ahora eh, eh, analizamos, y, eh, y es lo que digamos, está aceptado por el Grupo Internacional de Mieloma, la presencia de esta enfermedad mínima residual en la médula ósea, pero eh, también hemos visto sus limitaciones y que una alternativa válida y óptima a la médula ósea sería el análisis eh, de la enfermedad mínima residual en sangre periférica. Entonces, ¿qué datos tenemos del análisis de la enfermedad mínima residual en sangre periférica mediante espectrometría de masas? Pues en el contexto del GEN 2012 hemos hecho esto post consolidación, es decir, hemos, anal hemos analizado y comparado los resultados de la identificación del componente monoclonal en suero mediante espectrometría de masas y la presencia de células plasmáticas patológicas en la médula, es decir, de la enfermedad mínima residual en médula ósea, mediante Next Generation Flow, es decir, mediante citometría de flujo de nueva generación. La primera idea, como pueden ver en la diapositiva, es que post consolidación la inmunofijación identificaba la presencia de, de enfermedad de componente monoclonal, en este caso en un 25% de los pacientes, la espectrometría de masa es en un 34% de los pacientes y la Next Generation Flow en 43% de los pacientes. Entonces, eh, ¿cuál era el valor clínico de las dos técnicas para analizar la enfermedad mínima residual post consolidación en este estudio? Pues como pueden ver en la diapositiva, ambas técnicas tenían valor pronóstico en términos de supervivencia libre de progresión, comparable, yo diría, superior el de la NGF en un 10%, comparado con el de la espectrometría de masas, pues en base a esta mayor sensibilidad que hemos visto previamente que presenta la, la Next Generation Flow en comparación con la, con la, con la espectrometría de masas. Perdón. Entonces, el siguiente paso fue, eh, bueno, pues eh, puesto que vimos que eh, este valor pronóstico reducido de la, de la espectrometría de masas comparado con la NGF se debía a una falta de sensibilidad, lo que hicimos es aquellos pacientes que habían resultado negativos utilizando la espectrometría de masas que podríamos llamar convencional, reanalizamos estas muestras aplicando primero una cromatografía líquida que, como he dicho, como he dicho anteriormente, lo que hace es purificar más la muestra y aumentar la sensibilidad del proceso procedimiento. Como pueden ver aquí, al aplicar la cromatografía líquida antes de la espectrometría de masas, eh, digamos que eh, aumentó significativamente el porcentaje de pacientes en los que se identificaba la presencia de un componente monoclonal, 34% mediante espectrometría de masas convencional, 73% aplicando la cromatografía líquida y 44% utilizando la Next Generation Flow, como habíamos visto anteriormente. Sin embargo, pues como pueden ver aquí, esta, esta mayor sensibilidad que alcanzamos al aplicar la cromatografía líquida antes de la espectrometría de masas no se tradujo en un valor en un en mayor valor clínico comparado con la NGF como pueden ver en la diapositiva debido probablemente pues, a lo que podríamos llamar falsos positivos, es decir, a casos positivos por espectrometría de masas que durante el periodo de seguimiento hasta ahora pues, no han recaído. La buena noticia es que utilizando la cromatografía líquida antes de la espectrometría, el valor, el valor predictivo negativo de la espectrometría de masas teniendo como referencia los resultados de la Next Generation Flow, como pueden ver en la diapositiva, es de aproximadamente un 90%. Entonces, dados estos resultados, eh, son complementarios los resultados de la espectrometría de masas en sangre periférica y los de la, y los de la NGF en muestras de médula ósea. Pues mirando los resultados de esta diapositiva, la respuesta es no, porque como pueden ver, si se fijan en las, en las, en las tres curvas superiores de, de, de la gráfica, la supervivencia libre de progresión de los pacientes, que son doblemente negativos, es completamente superponible a aquella, de, a aquella supervivencia libre de progresión de los pacientes que son NGF negativos, independientemente de cómo sea la espectrometría de masas, y muy similar a la de los pacientes que son espectrometría de masas negativos, independientemente de cómo sea la NGF. Dos palabras para terminar sobre la glicosilación, eh, un hallazgo inesperado del uso de la espectrometría de masas para analizar el componente monoclonal en pacientes con gammapatías monoclonales es la presencia de glicosilación. La glicosilación aparece como un patrón atípico en el espectro, eh, unos eh, picos irregulares como pueden ver en la diapositiva, unos picos amplios y con una masa molecular superior a la esperada eh, teniendo, en teniendo en cuenta el isotipo del componente monoclonal. Entonces, en presentar los resultados de dos estudios de la Mayo, este primero en el que el análisis de más de 4.000 pacientes con eh, enfermedades de células plasmáticas mediante MASFIX identificó la presencia de glicosilación en un 5% de los pacientes y que la glicosilación se asociaba con mayor frecuencia a la cadena pesada IgM, a la cadena ligera CAPA, 
y de manera más importante pues, a la, a la, al diagnóstico de amiloidosis primaria, así como la enfermedad por aglutininas frías, de manera que en el contexto clínico adecuado la glicosilación de la cadena ligera en un paciente eh, bueno, pues, con, un, con, un, bueno, como digo, con un contexto clínico adecuado pues, nos debe hacer eh, sospechar que el diagnóstico final del paciente puede ser una amiloidosis o con menos frecuencia una enfermedad por aglutininas frías. Y en este estudio, eh, también de la clínica Mayo, eh, 414 pacientes con MGUS analizados mediante MASFIX en un 6% se identificó la presencia de glicosilación y este grupo de pacientes con cadena ligera glicosilada, como pueden ver en la diapositiva, eh, bueno, pues tenían un riesgo superior de progresión a amiloidosis, a mieloma y a otras enfermedades de células plasmáticas, de manera que bueno, pues la glicosilación se convierte en un, en un factor de riesgo importante de progresión en pacientes con gamma monoclonal de significado incierto. En nuestro estudio, como curiosidad, un 7% de los pacientes tenían la cadena ligera glicosilada y eh, eh, bueno, pues, eh, miramos a ver si la glicosilación de la cadena ligera tenía algún impacto en, el, en la supervivencia libre de progresión de los pacientes. Bueno, pues como pueden ver, aunque discretamente eh, por debajo digamos, del resto de pacientes, pues la diferencia en cuanto a supervivencia libre de progresión no resultó estadísticamente significativa con el seguimiento que tenemos hasta ahora. Y para concluir, eh, bueno, pues decir que la espectrometría de masas, incluyendo el análisis de la cadena ligera, como hemos visto, permite la identificación de, de un componente monoclonal como biomarcador en casos bueno, pues, eh, que de otra manera se considerarían no secretores, lo que permitiría pues, que, que fueran monitorizados de una manera más sencilla y probablemente mejor y, y que estos pacientes pudieran ser incluidos en ensayos clínicos que en una proporción pequeña de, de pacientes, eh, algunos picos extra que es capaz de identificar la espectrometría de masas, eh, bueno, se convierten en el, en el único biomarcador de enfermedad durante el seguimiento y que por lo tanto también facilitaría el, la monitorización de estos pacientes. Y durante el seguimiento, bueno, pues comparado con el análisis de la enfermedad mínima residual en médula ósea mediante NGF, pues la espectrometría de masas pre, muestra un valor pronóstico comparable en términos de supervivencia libre de progresión. Añadir una cromatografía líquida aumenta la sensibilidad del procedimiento, pero esto no se traduce en un, valor, en un mayor valor clínico. Lo que sí que aumenta de manera significativa es el valor predictivo negativo teniendo en cuenta los resultados de la NGF como, como referencia. Y finalmente que eh, bueno, pues en, en nuestros estudios la, la, digamos, la adición de un resultado concordante negativo con la técnica alternativa no aumenta el valor pronóstico, lo cual en otras palabras, eh, se puede, en otro, dicho en otras palabras, pues el, eh, digamos, los resultados de ambas técnicas, de la NGF y de la espectrometría de masas, no parecen ser complementarios eh, bueno, pues en el seguimiento de los pacientes con mieloma, por lo menos en nuestras manos. Y Muchas eh, gracias por, bueno, estos son mis agradecimientos y muchas gracias por, por vuestra atención. Muchas gracias, Noemí, por la presentación. Hablas de esta técnica novedosa, vamos a decir. Noemí, ¿cada Yo cuánto soy... lo harías en sangre periférica, complementándolo con eh, la Next Generation Flow en sangre periférica? ¿Lo alternarías o...? Entonces, eh, bueno, yo eh, vamos, estoy de acuerdo con lo que ha dicho Bruno antes, que, que bueno, eh, la ventaja de estas técnicas eh, que se hacen en sangre periférica es que la, las puedes hacer todos los meses. O sea, eh, quiero decir, eh, no, bueno, pues es una muestra que es fácilmente accesible, la técnica eh, bueno, pues es, es, es rápida, relativamente barata. O sea, en este sentido, eh, no, no veo limitación en. en, en ¿Cuál sería la frecuencia más correcta eh, de, del análisis bueno, mediante espectrometría de masas? Si, si hemos de, util, digamos, de, de, de utilizarla a la par eh, con, con técnicas de, de Next Generation Flow, eh, yo, bueno, como hemos comentado otras veces, digamos que lo que haría sería eh, bueno, pues seguir al paciente en sangre periférica mediante, mediante técnicas de espectrometría de masas. Un 20% de los pacientes que están en respuesta completa todavía vamos a, vamos a ver componente monoclonal y una vez que eh, bueno, pues la espectrometría de masas es negativa, entonces le haría la médula porque, bueno, pues como hemos comentado, el valor predictivo negativo de la técnica es muy alto y lo más seguro que en ese momento la médula también va a ser negativa. Eh, bueno, pues a la hora de, ya la última, el último comentario que se me ocurre, si hemos de diseñar un estudio en el que vamos a comparar los resultados de la, de la NGF en médula ósea con la espectrometría de masas en sangre periférica y tratamos de adelantar las respuestas, pues yo creo que la, la haría cada tres meses probablemente, haría, eh, bueno, pues en un paciente en respuesta completa, en el que la, la, la médula la vas a hacer cada seis meses o un año, pues la espectrometría la haría cada, cada tres meses probablemente. Gracias, Noé. 
No, mira, hay algún estudio que ya ha comparado espectrometría y cadenas ligeras libres. <risa> eh, pues sí, sí que lo hay, sí que lo hay. Y eh, déjame que piense. Eh, yo creo que, o sea, aplicando, creo que en un estudio de la Mayo y, y aplicando, eh, incluyendo el análisis de las cadenas ligeras libres en suero, creo recordar que la espectrometría de masas era ligeramente eh, más sensible que, eh, digamos, que, las, que el, el análisis mediante las cadenas ligeras libres en suero. Esta, sí, vamos, creo recordar que esos eran los. No hay muchos estudios el, y creo recordar que, este era, que estos eran los resultados, sí. Muy bien, ¿y crees que hay que, entonces, ¿tú crees que tenemos que comprar ya el aparato de espectrometría de masas y ponerlo? ¿Cuál? <risa> eh, bueno, a ver, eh, yo creo que, bueno, de hecho es que yo creo que el aparato todavía no se puede comprar. Eh, bueno, pues eh, los, de, los de la compañía, los de Binding Site, eh, bueno, que están desarrollándolo, tienen previsto eh, pues, eh, tenerlo a la venta el año que viene. Entonces, de momento no se puede siquiera comprar. Y si al año que viene, cuando esté disponible, pues bueno, yo creo que, que en teoría bueno pues va a ser relativamente barato rápido y va a ser está, va a estar automatizado o sea que bueno puede suponer una ventaja probablemente sí muy bien si no hay ninguna bueno. hay pregunta, alguna otra pregunta muy bien pues nada muchas gracias Noemí por la presentación y nada perfecto and now uh, now we will finish this this part of the of the this talks and we will have this the final keynote lecture it would be uh, By, given by Dr. Jesús San Miguel from the University of Navarra. He's the director of the, the Medicina Clínica Translacional de la Universidad de Navarra. And the, well, the, the, next, the lecture would be how to achieve the cure in multiple myeloma. So thank you very much, Jesús. And now it's your turn. The purpose of my talk is to review how to achieve cure in multiple myeloma. And as you can see in this picture, this is a long and windy road, but hopefully we will be there. These are my disclosures. And this slide try to answer the question whether or not myeloma is a curable disease. I used to say, if you ask me if myeloma is curable, I would say probably no. If you ask me if myeloma is uncurable, I will probably say no. Therefore, this is a confusion. No, because the answer is, is curable for a fraction of patients and is incurable also for a fraction of patients. But the cure concept was introduced already in 1991 by Barlogy, by Barlogy in this editorial in New England Journal of Medicine. And this is cartoon illustrate two randomized studies conducted in 2005 by the Spanish in the right and the Italian, the Gimema group. And they compare VTD versus TD following by the autologous transplant and maintenance with thalidomide. And as you can see, In both study, approximately one third of one fourth of the patients remain progression free at 10 years. And therefore, this patient could be operational cure. Nevertheless, for me to talk about a disease as a potential curable, probably the fraction of patients in continuous complete remission should increase to 40 to 50%. What I am planning to do today is to review these five steps, the roadmap for curing multiple myeloma. And the first one is to investigate the pathogenesis of multiple myeloma. Nisa, unfortunately, Canada is not in the world champions anymore because probably you have not looked in detail what were the Achilles heel of the enemy. Because if you want to win a football match, you need to understand what are the Achilles heel for disease dissemination and resistance. And this is what is illustrated here. And our work, our team has been working on the understanding better the clonal compartment and the circulating tumor cells, as well as the minimal residual disease cells. Regarding the clonal compartment, we have observed that mature B lymphocytes, as well as normal plasma cell, obtain it from double negative MRD cases in order to avoid contamination, these normal cells display the same clonal rearrangement or serve in the clonal plasma cell of the same patients. And by whole exome sequencing, we have observed that not only the mature B cell, 
but also the precursor B cells display somatic mutations, but not recurrent mutations, similar to the ones observed in the clonal plasma cell compartment. Therefore, our hypothesis is that there is already a clonal B cell infoplogesis at the early stages that will precede the development of multiple myeloma by preceding secondary driver mutation or copy non-viral normalities that will lead to the expansion of the myelomatose plasma cells. Regarding circulating plasma cells, what we have done for the biological characterization of the cell is to compare per samples and in these samples, uh, sorry, samples with per samples of circulating and bone marrow clonal plasma cells using transcriptional, transcriptose, transcriptosinal profiling and single cell level analysis and gene expression profiling. What we have found is that they are very similar. Only 58 genes were significantly deregulated in the circulating tumor cell at transcriptomic level. And in fact, we now consider that CTCs could replace the bone marrow plasma cell for investigation of genetic abnormalities because using temper genomic technology, 94% of the total mutation and all recurrent mutations observed in the clonal plasma cells in the bone marrow are present in the circulating plasma cell. And in fact, 85% of the copy number of alterations are present and the in total immunoglobulin translocation are present both in the bone marrow plasma cell and in the circulating plasma cell. Therefore, we can conclude that the circulating cells could replace the bone marrow for investigation of the genetic abnormalities. If we move now to the clinical part of the circulating plasma cell, we know that these cells are responsible for myeloma dissemination and could be a surrogate marker for myeloma spreading and for survival. And what we have done is to analyze in over 1,000 cases already the number of circulating tumor cells. And regarding the smoldering patients, we have seen that in 78% of the smoldering patients, you can detect circulating tumor cells. And those patients that have above 0.02% of circulating plasma cell correspond to ultra high risk smoldering patients because the median time to progression in these patients is 11 months. And moreover, as I'm going to show later on, this may replace the 22020 classification, replacing the bone marrow by the circulating analysis. Moreover, we have demonstrated that the number of circulating tumor cells is an independent prognostic factor, probably the most robust independent prognostic factor in a smoldering patient. In active myeloma patients, again, the number of the patients that have circulating plasma cell is extremely high. 92% of the patient has circulating tumor cell. And those that have one log above, 0.24% display poor prognosis. But I want to focus in the 8% of the patients that have no circulating plasma cell, because as you can see, the outcome of this patient is impressive. Probably this patient represents something similar to the MGAS profile, and probably I can comment later on about this. The second Achilles heel are the residual cells. If you want to cure the disease, you want, you want to win the, mass, the match, you need to eradicate all the tumor cells. And for this purpose, you need to use high sensitive techniques. Again, using transcriptomic analysis, we have compared diagnostic versus MRD cells in the same patients. And we have selected 40 patients, 20 standard, 28 standard risk, 12 high risk patients. And we have compared the cells at diagnosis, the clonal plasma cell at diagnosis, with the MRD clone resistant after six cycles of VRD. And what we had found is that approximately 700 
genes are significantly deregulated in the MRD cells. Our hypothesis is that probably the proportion of gene deregulated was much higher in the higher in the high risk patients as compared to the standard risk. But the reality proved to be exactly the opposite. Ninefold higher deregulated genes in MRD cells of a standard risk as compared to high risk patients. And the only explanation that we have for this is that probably in the high risk patients, the cytogenetic abnormality is so strong that predispose the cell to resist the treatment. By contrast, in the standard risk will be like a clonal selection or a transcriptomic adaptation in order to evade the treatment, in order to resist the treatment. It was now more than 20 years ago in 2002 that our group together with the UK group using flow cytometry separate for the first time the normal plasma cell from the myelomatose plasma cell in patients treated at that time with conventional chemotherapy. And what we observe is that patients that have high levels of residual myelomatose plasma cell show it significantly worse outcome as compared to those patients that have no residual myelomatose plasma cell with a sensitivity at that time of 10 to the minus three. Nomi put 10 years later using ASOPCR in around 100 patients demonstrated that the clonal rearrangement, if it is absent, the outcome is clearly better as compared to those cases that have a clonal rearrangement persistent after treatment. More recently, our group in more than 1,000 patients has compared the value of conventional response in prediction for predicting progression-free survival. And as you can see in the left part of the slide, patients that achieve a complete response have significantly longer outcome as compared with the BGPR, PR, or less than PR. But the interesting part of this figure is the following. We have selected within the CR patients, those that were MRD negative in green, as, and compare with the CR patients that remain MRD positive. And as you can see, the real value of CR come from the MRD negative cases. In fact, the MRD positive have the similar outcome of the patients that achieve BGPR. Nikhil Monsi, in a very large meta-analysis, including eight, more than 8,000 patients, have confirmed the value of achieving MRD negative status by uh, 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five sensitivity. And this was demonstrated in transplant eligible, transplant ineligible, and in the relapse setting. And in fact, the separation in the relapse setting or in the non-transplant candidate is more clear even than the separation in the transplant candidate. And the explanation here would be probably because patients, elderly patients or patients at relapse have only two or three shots. And if you don't achieve the best possible response upfront or in first relapse, the chances to survive or to achieve a prolonged progression for survival are going to be limited. But we have improved. And now we have next generation sequencing and next generation flow. And both techniques have shown reaching a sensitivity to 10 to the minus six, that the lowest the level of residual disease, the longer the survival. And probably some of you may ask, what is better, NGF or NGS? The Italian group has compared in the same patients, NGF and NGS, with a sensitivity of 10 to the minus five. And as you can see, the capacity to predict progression-free survival is identical with NGS as compared with NGF. Therefore, what matters is the sensitivity of the technique, not the technique by itself. And another important message is you need to achieve not only MRD negativity, similar to the CR that you need to confirm that the patient is in CR. Here, you need to confirm that the patient sustained an MRD negative status because the outcome is significantly better. But probably some of you 
may argue, okay, but Dr. San Miguel, but there are some patients that do not achieve an MRD negative status and I have a prolonged progression free survival. These patients are the patients that will revert after treatment into MGAS profile. And we have now demonstrated that this can be detected even up front, uh, patients that show a preservation of polyclonal plasma cells. And here you have that in patients with MGAS-like profile, achieving CR, the outcome is the same as those patients that are MGAS-like, not achieving CR. Therefore, CR is not critical in this patient and something similar applied to MRD negativity. And let me also share with you that the MRGAS profile also is associated with absence of circulating tumor cells. The proportion of patients that achieve an MGAS-like profile or absence of circulating is around 8%, no more than that. Therefore, my recommendation is if you are not sure and the patient has residual disease, you should, not, you should continue treatment. You should only stop treatment in case you have a clear demonstration that the patient has an MGAS-like profile. Moreover, now Bruno Paiva and his group has demonstrated the capacity upfront to predict the probability of achieving an MRD negative status with 80% precision. And the criteria that is associated with an MRD negative status is based on three parameters. The immune microenvironment, particularly the profile of CD27 negative cells, both T cells and NK cells, the absent or the present, depending of in positive or negative prediction of circulating tumor cells and the plasma cell clonality. These are the tumor burden, the cytogenetic abnormalities, and the immune microenvironment, the three best predictors for MRD negativity. But MRD should also be analyzed outside the bone marrow. And this is the PET. And here I'm showing the results with PET FDG. Also, we are using now PET methionine that is more sensitive, but with PET glucose that is the standard, you can see that in transplant, and it's also the same in non, the non-transplant candidate, patients that achieve an MRD negative status by PET, a PET negative enjoys significantly longer progression free survival. The third step to try to cure the patients, early detection and early intervention to treat disease causation instead of symptomatology. And here in this slide, we illustrate two important randomized studies that were designed with one goal, to delay disease progression. The more mature data correspond to the Spanish trial in which Lendex was compared with observation in high-risk smoldering myeloma. I should emphasize that this study has been conducted only in high-risk patients because the American study also included intermediate risk. In the Spanish study, the data that was published by Marimi Mateos in 2013 in New England Journal of Medicine and has been recently updated, these data demonstrate that the high-risk population, the median time to progression is expected. 50% of the patient progress in two years. The median time to progression was 2.1 year. By contrast, in the experimental arm, the median time to progression was 9.5 years. Imagine other studies in which you will have seven years different in active myeloma, in progression-free survival. Nobody will discuss that this will be a new treatment standard of care. Moreover, in this study, we have demonstrated that the experimental trial, the experimental arm, was associated with 43% reduction in risk of death. No achieved median overall survival versus 8.5 months, which demonstrate that early intervention is not associated with more resistant relapses. The data has been reproduced by the American group 
comparing length versus observation, as you can see here, the hazard ratio is 0.28, almost identical to the 0.25 that has been observed in the Spanish study. At the ASH meeting, we are going to have the opportunity to see the results of another strategy for high risk modeling. It's a curative strategy in order to eradicate the disease and to maintain an MRD negative status for more than five years in at least half of the patients. And probably we are in this process. This data is going to be presented again by Dr. Mateos and the time to progress into symptomatic disease in the previous, because this is this slide correspond to the previous as in this as you will have the update information as well as you will have update information of the ascent trial that has been both of them i think are particularly relevant studies that will be presented at the next as meeting and last but not least now let me focus on the active myeloma patients both the standard risk and the high risk i think everybody will agree that currently myeloma treatment is highly expensive. And the cheapest medicine is the one that is able to cure the patient. And not to use the best drug upfront is an expensive and frustrating approach. In this slide, I'm sharing with you the information of the Jane 2012 trial. And here in the circles, you have the outcome of standard risk patients in green that achieve dark green, that achieve an MRD negative status, standard risk patients that remain MRD positive after autologous transplant, huge difference. Therefore, my question for you is the following. If you have a treatment, treatment AA, that is able to induce four times more MRD negative chances than treatment BB, which treatment will you use? By sure, you will go for treatment AA. Therefore, this is the first message the best treatment should be used not only for the high risk, but particularly for the standard risk patient. Otherwise, will be a wrong philosophical approach. What about the high risk patient and the impact of minimal residual disease? Again, these data correspond to the GIM 2012 and 14 trial. In the left part of the slide, I want you to focus on the outcome on patients according to revised IS, and particularly revised ISS3 patients. Patients that remain MRD positive after autologous transplant and had at presentation revised ISS3. Look the median progression free survival, 14 months. By contrast, the same revised ISS3 patients, if they achieve an MRD negative status, are here. Therefore, our goal in high risk is to eradicate residual cells because if you have residual cells with P53, one P amplification, these patients will relapse very soon and you will have this picture instead of this one. What is our current policy outside of clinical trials for treating a transplant candidate patient? A quadruplet, VRD, plus CD38 and monoclonal antibody, KRD could be an option. Autologous transplant, if it's high risk, we offer a tandem autologous transplant. If the patient after transplant is MRD negative, we move into maintenance. If remain MRD positive, we will use consolidation, but different to the treatment that has been used upfront. For instance, if I have not used KRD, I will consider carfilzomib in this situation. I'm sure that many American people will prefer a quadruplet and to postpone the transplant. It's a bit risky because if you postpone the transplant in the determination trial, we have seen that only a small fraction of patients eventually receive the transplant. And my recommendation is if you are planning to use a transplant, to, give, uh, to offer a transplant, and the patient remain after 10 cycles, for instance, MRD positive, go directly to the transplant in this situation. Otherwise, you can reserve the transplant for a late relapse. And how efficient is this approach? And I'm sharing with you the data that was presented by Dr. Vlade and Dr. La Huerta at the last International Malema Society meeting. 
Uh, this is the gym 2012-14 trial with simple treatment, VRD, consolidation, transplant, maintenance with lenalidomide and a proteasome inhibitor. And here you have the median progression free survival, 80 months. The median overall survival has not been reached at seven years. The majority of the patients remain uh, survival. And this data is clearly superior to anything previously reported in the literature with something that is affordable in, for most centers and in many countries. What about the elderly population? In the elderly population, the problem is the attrition rate. Here you have in the left part, what is the attrition rate in UK? And in the right part, what is the attrition rate in, the Austra in Australia? And if you focus, focus, for instance, in patients over the age of 70, only 35% of the patients will receive more than two lines of therapy. Therefore, the first treatment, the first line of treatment is critical in this patient. And what is the best treatment? Clearly, DARA RD. And probably a monoclonal anti-CD38 anti plus VRD or KRD will be even superior. But so far, the best demonstrated in randomized trial is DARA RD with a median progression free survival of 62 months. In the last part of my uh, talk, I will discuss about new strategies, because unfortunately, if we want to achieve the cure of goal, we need to improve further on. And these new strategies should include three possibilities. First, to adapt treatment in order to eradicate residual disease upfront. Second, early rescue intervention based on early detection of resistance. And third, to move the biospecific, the immunotherapy, CAR-Ts, to move early on on the treatment. This is an example of the adapted therapy according to MRD. Here, as you can see, patients will receive is, is a KRD. This is a French study, the Midas study. And there, the patients are going to be stratified in high or standard risk, not according to cytogenetics, but according to MRD. The MRD negative patients, the standard risk, will receive less intensive treatment. In, even they will compare transplant or not transplant. By contrast, in the high risk group, patients will receive, all patients will receive at least one transplant or tandem transplant and the consolidation, particularly, they will include ISA plus ivertomide. Another possibility to, is to adapt the intensity and the duration or the duration. And this was shown by Luciano Costa in the master trial. And as you can see in this slide, patients that receive treatment and achieve a sustained MRD, at least for two consecutive observation, MRD negative, they call MRD sure, they offer to stop treatment. And as you can see, this approach can be good in patients without high risk cytogenetics or only one risk cytogenetics. By contrast, I think it's not a wise approach for patients with two cytogenetic abnormalities, what they call ultra high risk. Can we optimize based on MRD, the intensity of the duration and the duration of maintenance? The Spanish group used two years maintenance with RD or ISA plus RD. And after the two years, they compare in MRD positive patients, they continue treatment while they stop in the MRD negative patients. And here you have the outcome. And as you can see, after stopping treatment, if two years of maintenance, after two years of maintenance, if you stop treatment, the MRD negative status is associated with a very long progression free survival. Very few patients have relapsed. By contrast, in the MRD patients after two years maintenance, if they continue to receive Lendex for three additional years, the relapse is significantly higher. Therefore, if you want to win this battle, in these patients that remain MRD positive, you need to change and probably to use something different. The other strategy that I recommended is early rescue intervention. And the Nordic group has proposed this attractive strategy 
in patients receiving induction with DRD, single or tandem transplant, consolidation, and then the patients are going to be randomized into two groups. One group is to start treatment at the time of MRD relapse, and the other group is to start treatment only when there is a progression according to AMWG criteria. Therefore, this trial could help us to answer the important question whether early intervention at the time of MRD conversion could be the best approach. And last but not least, to move immunotherapy early on. Immunotherapy will include the new immunomodulatory drugs, the new cell mods, such as Iberdomide and 92480, that has been associated with 30-40% responses in patients triple pentarefractory that has failed even other immunomodulatory drugs. But probably the most attractive are the antibodies that are conjugated and especially the biospecific antibodies. The biospecific antibodies induce approximately 60 to 70% of responses. There are different targets, BSMA, GPSA5D, FC, HI5, and in all these studies, around 60, 70 percent, the more mature data correspond to teclistamat. Now we have the median progression for survival that is 11 months. And based on this data, the Spanish group is close to activate a, a, a clinical trial devoted to achieve and maintain MRD negative status in high risk patients that they will receive induction with RBRD. Then the clistamab, six cycles in the patient remain MRD negative, they will continue with the clistamab for two years. In they if they remain positive, if they, then we will switch to talketamab and even autologous transplant if, they, if talketamab has not been able to eradicate the residual disease. But the most fascinating results come from the CAR T. And in this slide, I'm sharing with you the information of either cell. On, and Cylta cell. Um, in both of them, it's clear that to achieve complete response with the best possible response with CAR T is relevant because with either cell, the median progression free survival in patients achieving complete response is 20%, although only one third of the patients achieve complete response. With Cylta cell, 80% of the patients achieve a complete response. And here you have the outcome for all patients. And for patients, sorry, this is the opposite. And for patients that achieve a complete response, 71% are progression free at two years. Based on these positive results, many people now is trying to investigate the value of CARTIS in early relapse, in the frontline setting, or in patients that has achieved a suboptimal response after autologous transplant. And the last slide correspond to the last message. Probably we are different from the solid tumor doctors, but we should learn from them that molecular lesion may predict response. In myeloma, due to the complexity of genetic lesion, and we have just here from Nisa Balis the uh, beautiful presentation, the complexity of the genetic lesions in myeloma required not a single agent, but why not to use target agents in combination with the standard of care in order to eradicate the disease more efficient, particularly in patients that have a clear identified abnormality or mutation. This is my last slide. I think I try to share with you that progress in myeloma has been able to identify new prognostic factors. We have now the circulating tumor cell, the MRD, and in fact, myeloma is not a single disease. There are many myeloma subtypes, and we need to adapt the treatment because the discovery of new drugs with singular mechanism of action is really an, a great opportunity to individualize and to tailor treatment according to the patient's need. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jesus. Excellent presentation as, as usual. So you have been speaking about the, the, well, we have been hearing today about the CTC, that's a way to understand the, the disease biology and the risk. Do you think this we are speaking here, because I, this is something that came to my mind, about burden of disease, or is, that, is, is it something different uh, from a pathological point of view? To have Thank you very much. Disease. Thank you very much, Enrique, because this is a very, very, very wise question. 
in fact, although there is a correlation between tumor burden in the bone marrow and the number of circulating plasma cells, there is not a linear correlation. And this clearly explains that the circulating tumor cells aggress from the bone marrow probably through epoxic niche looking for another niche and is not only the tumor burden that is infiltrating the marrow what favor the aggression of the circulating tumor cells thank you very much for the question thank you very much i think it's time to to end up this long day today and um, so i thank all the speakers i thank all the attendees of course and jesus just for your last presentation and i want to thank i didn't do it before the sponsor for Janssen, Amgen, Sanofi, GSK, and also the collaboration of Pfizer. And well, we will see us tomorrow. We will, tomorrow we will have another day, long day, with uh, speaking about the novel, novel therapies in myeloma, novel phytogenetic therapies. So see you. And also I, I also thank Marie Diaz, my commodinator, that she's still there. And so, and thank you. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much, Enrique, and congratulations for this activity.